excited to be with you today because I'm going to be talking about my favorite subject and that is Jesus and walking with him through our lives. Jesus is our friend, our savior, our God. He is our husband and he is the being in heaven that is chosen to be with us. God the Father cannot be with us in person because he is in heaven, he's on his throne and he has chosen from eternity for his son to be with us. God with us is what he is called. Amen. And that is a wonderful experience as we could talk to the men of old and Jesus would walk and talk with them. And so, the same with us. He wants to walk and talk with us all the time. And the more we do that, the more deeply in love with him we become. The more hateful is our, our, our sins and the more we want to be totally separate in every way from our enemy, the devil who hates Jesus and he hates us and he wants to bring us down. But we can walk with Jesus every day and so let's have a prayer that God will help us as we consider these things. Dear Father in heaven, dear Jesus, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity of knowing God in the person of Jesus Christ. It is a, t a, com a tremendous miracle, a tremendous um, incomprehensible thing to <laughs> know that God can be with us and is with us. But Lord, we want to consider that today and praise you for it. And so we ask you to pour out your Holy Spirit today upon us as we talk about these things and as we read your scriptures and the spirit of prophecy to help us understand better. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to start with Matthew 8, 17. Matthew 8, 17. Actually, I'm going to begin with verse 14. And the caption here in my Bible, I'm using the NIV. The caption here uh, says, Jesus heals many. Verse 14, when Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. He touched her hand and the fever left her. And she got up and began to wait on him. When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him. And he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and carried our diseases. Jesus was the one in the beginning who created Adam and Eve. But before he created mankind, in the eons of eternity, God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit made a plan before they created beings and especially uh, evidently uh, before the, this world uh, and Adam and Eve were created, the human race, because this world is a, um, a place where the plan of salvation would be revealed in the most um, perfect way and God knew ahead of time that there would be a problem. 
And so he provided from the very beginning his son to be a part of all that would happen. I just want to go back in time to look at this planning that was done by God the Father and God the Son. And this is from Bible Commentaries, Volume 6, page 1082. God had a knowledge of the events of the future. Even before the creation of the world, he did not make his purposes to fit circumstances, but he allowed matters to develop and work out. He did not work to, begin, to bring about a certain condition of things, but he knew that such a condition would exist. The plan that should be carried out upon the defection of any of the high intelligences of heaven, this is the secret, the mystery, which has been hid for ages. And an offering was prepared in the e eternal purposes to do the very work which God has done for fallen humanity. 6 B.C. 1082. So God in his omnis omnipotence and omniscience, his all-knowing, could see ahead from the eons of eternity that these things that have happened would happen. You know, it all began with Lucifer in heaven, the terrible things that have happened, that sin brings upon the universe. It began with the highest angel in heaven. And it's a mystery. Sin is a mystery. Why Lucifer should do this when he was created as a sinless being? And he was given everything that could be given. And yet he fell and has become the enemy of God. And so we um, are a result of this experience, this experiment. We, as human beings, created in the image of God, and yet with the capacity of sinning, should we choose to do that, as all beings are. This shows how important to God free will choice is. He could make people that were automatons. He could make angels that were automatons that would have to serve him because they were created that way. But God loves us to love him because we value him, because we see his qualities, that we love him and serve him because we see his omnipotence, his omniscience, we see his character, we see his love, and that we choose, and his law, and that we choose to follow him. From a heart of love. Amen. Jesus will accept and God will accept nothing less for those who will live with him forever. Now, in this plan, which was made before the creation of the world, um, the world was to be, Ellen White says, of the people of the world were to be a new and distinct order. Ellen White says. Now, I don't know what, exactly what that means. Whether it means uh, procreation, uh, I don't know. But when he made us, this world, human beings, he made us in a way that, um, that the whole plan of salvation could be worked out. The perfect plan that he made. And so, eons before anything was created, the plan was worked out, that Jesus would be someday the Lamb of God that was sacrificed for the salvation of each person and for uh, making the universe safe from then on. 
And in this plan, he created us to fill the vac vacancies in heaven that were made by the angels. I mean, this is amazing that to take the place of Lucifer and the third of the angels who fell was the very purpose for which you and I were created. And someday, if we follow the Lord, we will be there around the throne, vindicating the character of God as Lucifer should have done. Amen. Now, you know that Lucifer was, um, was the highest angel in heaven, and he was called a covering cherub. And I asked the Lord one time, what does that mean, covering? What was he supposed to cover? And the Lord brought to my mind that the covering cherub, and, and by the way, Ellen White does say that Gabriel was the other one, if you've ever wondered who the other one was, um, that these uh, giant intellect, giant character, formed in the image of God, beings were there as we see over the, in the, uh, Ark, on the Ark of the Covenant in the most holy place of the sanctuary. They were there covering the law or character because the law is an expression of his character. And they were covering that. Now, so when I asked the Lord, what is it what does what what uh, does god what did god need when he had covering cherubs what were they to cover and um the lord put in my mind that they were covering the character of god um and that i thought you know and the lord helped me to be thinking about that what if somebody ever had a question about God? Was God supposed to say, well, I'm great and I'm wonderful and I'm powerful and I'm, you know, and I, and I, and I. Is that um, what would have um, helped anybody who had questions? Is that what would help them to understand him better? Because it sounds like pride, it sounds like self. And so the covering cherubs were to know God, know his purpose, be with him, understand the law, have giant intellects that could comprehend these things. And if there was ever a question, they were to cover his reputation, so to speak, with created beings to answer questions about God in a positive way. Oh, yes, God is loving and da 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 whatever, you know. Unfortunately, the head covering cherub did just the opposite. He began to criticize God. He began to use his high position to, uh, to throw questions about his law, about his character, about who he was. And he left, Ellen White says, he left his place. And he went and began to stir up things among the other angels. And he would say, you know, you think God is loving. And you think God is all uh, wise and kind and all of that thing. But I know him better than any of you do. And I'm telling you, there's another side to God. If you ever sin... If you would ever disagree with him, you would see there's another side to God and he is wrathful. He's, you know, and so whatever it was that Satan said, he cast aspersion on the character of God. Now, nobody had ever seen that side of God. But when the closest angel in heaven said, I know him better than you do. And I'm telling you, there's another side to God. It's like, really? I mean, seriously? And so he began to say these evil things about God's character. The exact opposite of what he was created for. Now, you know the story. You know how um, 
how he was cast out of heaven with those who, the a third of the angels. Uh, Ellen White t does tell us that almost half of the angels at one time were considering this, but uh, uh, and that Gabriel went among the angels as well and fought back. And God the Father and God the Son also came and talked to them. And uh, so finally, some of those who were wavering came back, and, uh, and we know that only a third, but that's a lot, uh, fell. Now, God had a plan to take care of that, if any should fall. That plan was to repopulate heaven with the human race. I'm going to read a little bit here. Uh, a couple of things on that order. This is from Signs of the Times, uh, 52901. God created man for his glory. It was his purpose to repopulate heaven with the human race when after a period of test and trial, they had proved to be loyal to him Adam was to be tested to see whether he would be obedient. Had he stood the test, his thoughts would have been as the thoughts of God. His character would have been molded after the similitude of the divine character. We, are to be, we have been created with a character. Character is thoughts and feelings combined, Ellen White says. Thoughts and feelings. So character, the very thoughts and feelings of God are put into the human race, were put into the human race in the beginning. Now we have fallen from that, but I'm saying in the beginning. We were created for a special purpose, a new type of creation um, in the human race. Also, this is Review and Herald 508, 1894. Jesus came to our world to dispute the authority of Satan. He came to restore in man the defaced image of God, to raise him, to elevate him, fit him for companionship with the angels of heaven, to take the position in the courts of God which Satan forfeited through rebellion. That's a pretty high position. Mm -hmm. But you know what? We have to be tested. Adam and Eve were tested in the garden in their perfect state. The angels had told them about the, um, uh, the fall of Lucifer. It wasn't that they didn't know. But they were created with a free will, uh, a desire to know and understand. And so when Eve disobeyed God and went to the tree and came under the spell of that, that um, uh, serpent, Satan talking through the serpent, using the serpent, um, he did the same thing to Eve that he did to the angels in heaven. And he cast aspersion on the character of God. And so Lucifer, first of all, according to Ellen White and Patriarchs and Prophets, um, affirmed her by telling her she was very beautiful. She did like that, you like to hear that. And, uh, and then he said, um, has God told you not to eat of this tree? And she repeated, yes, he has told us not to eat of the tree lest we die. And he began to tell her, according to spirit of prophecy, to tell her that God was keeping something from her and that the real truth was that if she ate of the tree, this was the real truth that he, that he said to, to Eve, if, the, if she ate of the tree, she would become like a god and rise above her position and that she would, that God didn't want her to eat of the tree and be like him. Now, is that crazy? But she began to think about that. Wow. I mean, 
God doesn't want me to eat of the tree because if I do, I'll be like God. Mm -hmm. Well, then I think I'll do that. Knowledge, wisdom, is that what I'm going to get? Well, then, and so of course we know that she ate and took it to her husband. Now, isn't it interesting that there, that, the, that the devil was so devious and sly that he turned the purpose of God to keep her from doing this and falling far below what uh, he had chosen them and tell her she's going to have something that's above what God had for her. And you know, that's kind of the way he does still. He tells people, you're just being restricted by being a Christian, by accepting God. If you follow me, you can do anything. You can eat anything you want to. You can watch anything you want to. You can play anything you want to. What, if you just follow me, you will have freedom to really be yourself and express yourself. And of course, this is where the world is going. They are following after the lies of the enemy. And if it were not that Jesus came here to show what God is really like, then everybody would follow the devil. Every soul would, because we already have inherited the sins of the fathers upon the children from Adam and Eve's sin. So what has Jesus done? In the great um, plan that God made in the beginning, the Son of God was chosen to come here and show what God is really like. He's the real covering cherub, so to speak. He is to cover God's reputation and came here in human flesh to show the real character of God the Father and of the Godhead, the loving person that he was. And so I want to just talk a little bit about that in order to do that, in order to, to become like one of us and be here and give up his divinity forever, divin not divinity, but uh, he gave up his omnipresence, where he is um, a man and divine at the same time, and he, he now cannot be in two places in the universe at the same time, only through the Holy Spirit. But... He came here and brought God to us, God with us. And he walked with us and he talked with us. And I just love to see that side of Jesus because in the Old Testament, some people throw out the Old Testament because they say uh, that was the old mean God and uh, he killed people and whatever. And uh, they say, but the New Testament is Jesus. Jesus is the God of the Old Testament. God the Father did not come down here and be in the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. It was Jesus who was always the God that was the part of the Godhead that was sent here to represent the whole Godhead. And so it was Jesus that walked with Abraham as a friend. Can you imagine that? He just showed up one day with a couple of angels and, and ate with Abraham in the tent and talked to Sarah and you know, he looked like a human being and, and they and, and until got a little further along and then all of a sudden Abraham realized this is not just another person. This is my Lord. And then he walked with, um, with Moses in an incredible way and stayed that whole 40 years in the wilderness in the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. And he would come down and talk with Moses. When all, all, a lot of times it says in these encounters that Moses would have with, with Christ, um, he would, he would just, the, the pillar would, would come down of cloud or, or fire and come down and Moses would go to the entrance of the temple of the sanctuary and there they would have a discussion. They would talk things over. 
what are we going to do now? You know, that kind of thing. Of course, that was Moses wondering from Jesus, from God, what, what we're going to do with these people. They're, they're doing this and they're rebelling about that and the, great, and the multitude who wants to stone me and take, you know, everybody back to Egypt. And so they would talk it over and uh, God always, Jesus, would always have a communication for him, telling him what to do. It was, and we see this in the Old and New Testament both, that it was Jesus all the way through, Jesus in the burning bush, you know, the whole time Moses and the people of Israel, he was with them, God with us. He went through the will. Do you think he would have preferred to be in heaven sitting on the throne beside of his father? Send maybe Gabriel down or somebody else, you know, to do it? No. He was here, and he is still here with us. Don't you want to walk with him and talk with him? You know, we can. But in order for him to be able to do this and empathize with us, he had to come here and experience all the things that we experience, except for sin. So I want to just read Isaiah 53, just a, a little bit of it. It's long. I won't read the whole thing. But just to... Um, to remind us what Jesus had to do to be able to walk with us every day. Even today, he walks with us by his spirit. Sometimes he comes through and visits people. I know um, a few times that he, that I personally know people that Jesus has come, not visibly, but uh, in talking with them. Um, and so he is still God with us here. Um, I'm going to begin with um, chapter 53, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4. Surely he took our, up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. Now this is being written ahead of time, as if it were already true as if it was written afterwards, but this is written ahead of time. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and who can speak of his descendants? He was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people. He was stricken. Verse 11, after the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Amen. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Jesus is the one that we need to have for a friend. You know, people sometimes when they're going through things, and they will call up a friend and say, oh, I'm going through this and I'm going through that. Now, I'm not saying that's wrong, because we can uh, empathize with one another, we can pray for one another, we can help bear one another's burdens, the Bible tells us. But it's really Jesus that is the real friend that p can pick us up and heal us when we are wounded by sin, by Satan, by the tempter, by our own mistakes, and so forth. And so I just want to very quickly go uh, 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 in a line from beginning to end of how Jesus, in doing this, can bring us back to the place where we can be in heaven and take the place of the angels who fell. What was the question that uh, Lucifer, uh, now Satan, uh, asked 
or things that he said that caused the, the angels to fall in the first place. Um, and he said, you don't know God like I do. He has another side. He's, he, can, he can wipe you out in a minute. If you sin, poof, or whatever. He, he, he disparaged the character of God as having another side, a mean God, a, a God that, that uh, won't allow anybody to break his law or else you will suffer uh, eternal death as a result of breaking his law. But in the plan that was made, when Jesus came here, he had to experience every single thing that every single person would ever experience and pass the test perfectly. And show us, how do you go through that? When you go through a trial, and, Jesus, and you know Jesus has gone through the same thing, not the exact circumstances, but the inner soul, the temptation that it is to sin, that brings us to sin. But he went through that experience without sinning. And so he went through his whole life completely, perfectly doing what we need to do when we go through that same temptation. And so I want to read um, Psalms 40. When he came here, he came for one purpose, and that is to proclaim the will of God and to live that out the law of God is the standard in heaven. And the law of God, when we get there, is the standard of holiness and righteousness. So Jesus came into the world somewhat different than we do, in that when we come into the world, we come in a fallen being. When Jesus came into the world, he had the law of God in his heart already. Amen. He started out that way. We don't. We start out with transgressions of our fathers upon the, you know, the fathers and mothers and so forth, third and fourth generation back, all the way back to Adam and Eve. We come with a fallen nature. He came with the fallen nature as a physical, emotional, in that he could get tired, he could be worn, and he, he could sleep through a storm that was scary or whatever, because he had human nature. And he felt the same things that we feel when we're going through trial. But he came with a law in his heart, and that is our salvation. If he had come with a fallen nature, including the broken law, then there would be no, he would be just like us. He couldn't save anybody. So here in Psalms, it says, uh, 40 verse 7 and, um, 7 and 8, Then I said, here I am, I have come. It is written about me in the scroll. It is written about him as, just as we read in Isaiah 53. And throughout scriptures, it's written in the Bible about him. It is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. You see, when people are trying to figure out what is the difference between Jesus and us. Praise the Lord, there are similarities and there are differences. He had the same body, the same emotions of getting tired and extremely painful for him when he was rejected, when he was spurned, that hurt him deeply, more than even it does for us because we're deadened by sin. And he felt all the emotions of a human being, but he did not have the sin because he had the law in his heart when he came here. And it's a good thing he did because he can now bring us back to that same place where we have the law in our heart. And when we have the law by walking with Jesus, learning from him, then when, uh, when Satan comes, we will feel the same way about that temptation as Jesus did. And once the, we have a special remnant at the end of time who come all the way back to the character of Christ and feel the same way about sin as he did, 
That's the 144,000. That's the end of the great controversy. That is because we have walked with Jesus all the way, day by day, day by day. Now I want to um, talk a little bit about what's it like in a day by day experience to go through this life. Um, Satan is after us and believe me, even more so to the final generation because he can read, he can see that, that this uh, human race was created for the purpose of taking his place. So he comes down, the, the Bible says, in wrath upon especially the final generation because he doesn't want us to ever get back to that unfallen state that he left when he left heaven. And so the wrath of the enemy is especially upon the final generation. He does not want a finished product of the plan of salvation. But there will be, and it will be those who understand that Jesus' character, his thoughts and feelings are to replace our thoughts and feelings. Amen. Jesus' thoughts and feelings are righteous. We are to have thoughts and feelings of, that are righteous. The character of Jesus is to be placed in us, but that certainly uh, is not going to be done without our cooperation. So let's say that we go through a day and we have a lot of trials that day, and sometimes we do. Let's say somebody stirs up our, our animosity. They say something mean. You know, in families, there are times where uh, things happen that are hurtful. At least that is what I experience. And that is that somebody might hurt my feelings or whatever. And depending upon how I react, whether I react in anger, whether I criticize, whether I feel sorry for myself and or whatever, uh, depending upon how I react, it can show me, oh, Jesus, I know that that's not like you because you suffered, but you did not get angry. Then Jesus, I want to be like you. We can have prayer. We can have relationship with Jesus and say, please, Lord, change me. Take all this anger away. Give me what you had when you were here and you walked the pathway and you never got upset and angry with people. You never retaliated against people. I want to be like that. I want to have your perfect character Amen. in me through the Holy Amen. Spirit and through the Word. Amen. So it takes something. It takes your whole heart. It takes your whole mind, your whole spirit into this thing to receive that kind of cleansing. Day by day, moment by moment, because if you're off duty, you know, sometimes that's when the, because the devil is there, he's waiting, just waiting. Ah, oh, here's an opportunity to get her. I know her from the past, and she gets upset in this situation, so let's make that situation happen, and then she'll fall. Mm -hmm. And then she, we'll say, ha, you'd sinned again. You know, the devil is there all the time trying to get us so that we will never be overcomers. If it weren't for Jesus and his perfection, Amen. that is stored up mm -hmm. in the Holy Spirit. Because while Jesus was living this perfect life under all circumstances, the Holy Spirit was in him. He was filled with the Spirit when he came. And the Spirit was writing that down, so to speak. I mean, not really mm -hmm. writing it down. But the Holy Spirit was taking that as a storehouse for what he can now give you and me. He stored all that up of Jesus' perfection, Jesus' reactions, Jesus' thoughts and feelings, Jesus' words, and he has that all written in him, and therefore, him meaning the Holy Spirit. And therefore, now, when we walk and talk with Jesus, the Holy Spirit can give us the same thing. Amen. If we pray, if we spend time with the Lord, it's not just going to happen. It's going to mean that we would need to, that's what the, 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 my subject is about today, is walking with Jesus. Amen. Like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen. Like Moses, talk to him. Isn't that what Moses did? Yeah. said, what am I supposed to do now? Look at all these people. You know, now he did fail right at the end. 
and I'm sorry for that in a way. In another way, it, it, it just shows, you know, the mercy of Jesus because mm -hmm. Jesus, Moses, Moses and Jesus were such friends that Jesus came not long after that and resurrected him. You know, he wanted him to be in heaven with him. <laughs> Isn't that sweet? And he wants us to be in heaven with him Amen. because we're written upon his heart. Amen. Every day ordained for me was written in your book before one of them came to be. That's Psalms 139, I believe. Um, every day ordained for me. Now, I used to think, you mean you wrote in all my sins in there? No. Every day ordained for me was written in the book perfectly. But then we have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so, in the closing acts of, of Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary, he's going to cleanse all those things that are unlike that perfect plan. Don't you like it? You know, he, the Bible says that he knew us from the beginning of time. Amen. One time I said to the Lord, Do you, did you know me personally from the beginning of time? And he said to me in my mind, he said, I knew your blueprint. You are not an accident. You were written in the book of life before one of your days came to be. And I'll read that from Psalms 139, 13. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. Verse 16, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Amen. Doesn't it give you a sense of purpose? And to not want to, to um, disappoint the Lord, you know, uh, there's going to be so many wicked people that they, that they never respond to the Holy Spirit. And they will have to be destroyed at the end of time because they chose not to. But each of us can, st the time is still here, each of us can choose to live that life. Every day ordained for me was written in your book before one of them came to be. So just as Jesus' life was planned out before he ever came so that he would have the experience of every person. Nobody can say, oh, but you didn't experience what I'm going through. Well, he did in one way or another. No, he wasn't married. No, he didn't have children. But he went through the, uh, the depth of the experience that we go through in relationships of all kinds. He had relationships that were that were. Um, sad, he was lonely, he was rejected, uh, he was spit upon, he was uh, anything that could happen to a human being, he had to go through that and have the right feelings. Even on the cross he said, Father forgive them for they know not what they do. Amen. Even on the cross his heart was a heart of love. And we can have that sometimes, don't you go through a cross experience where you feel like I can't, I can't take it. I just can't take any more. I'm getting down off this cross or whatever it may be. But Jesus didn't get down for you. And so we can talk to him because the Holy Spirit has written in him all the perfection of Jesus that he can now give us. The perfect thoughts, the perfect feelings. He didn't sin, but he was counted as a sinner. He was treated as one and he was hurt to the core by the things that he had to go through. Now, I just want to read something here real quick as I, as I get finished. Ellen White says in That I May Know Him 29, page 29, not one act of Christ's life was unimportant. Not one act in Christ's life was unimportant. Every event of his life was for the benefit of his followers in future times. Amen. So he went through anything that you go through, he went through and he understands 
what it feels like to be hurt, to be rejected, to be disappointed, etc., etc. He knows, he knows because the plan for him was all written out before he ever came here. Remember on the cross, he said, so that it will be fulfilled. I do this or I say this or whatever. He knew the plan and he lived that plan without a flaw. So now, not one act of Christ's life was unimportant. Every event of his life was for the benefit of his followers in future times. So when you're having a relationship with Jesus, you can say to him, Lord, when you were going through this, what did you think? What did you feel? How did you overcome that? We can have a communion with Christ and he will, he will tell you. He wants to talk to you. He wants to share with you. Amen. Have that intimate relationship with him through the Holy Spirit even Amen. now. Christ's Object Lessons 149. All that Christ received from God, we too may have. Amen. Then ask and receive with the persevering faith of Jacob, with the unyielding persistence of Elijah. Amen. Claim for yourself all that God has promised. Amen. It's there Amen. in his blood. What does that mean? You know, some people say, I'm covered by the blood, and they keep sinning because I'm covered with the blood. That's not what the blood of Jesus is for, even though it does to some extent in the sense that his blood does have that perfect life. And as we repent, we can have the benefit of that perfect life. But eventually, God wants us to have not only the forgiveness, but the victory Amen. that he has in his blood. And that is for us at the end of time. And I believe that's where we are right now. Amen. We're at the end. Amen. And he wants a bride. He wants a finished work Amen. of salvation. Hallelujah. He wants to see in his people his own image, his own character. And as we walk and talk with him, the Holy Spirit can guide you. I mean, many times um, when I'm, I talk to the Lord and I'll say, if I'm going through a trial especially, I will talk to the Lord as I'm going through it and I'll say, Lord, how did you feel when you were going through that? And he'll tell me. He'll say compassion or he'll quote a text to me. The Holy Spirit, you know, bring that back to my, oh, thank you, Lord, that's right. Well, put that in me right now. Would you put that thought in me? Help me to think the way you thought when you were going through this particular trial. And he will. And he'll not only put that thought in my mind, but he'll give me the power of the Holy Spirit Amen. at that point to live the life of Jesus. It's never on our own. It's never because we worked harder and finally got there. It's because we have a personal walk with Jesus. Amen. And through the Holy Spirit, he will put and plant in us his own character. Amen. I praise him for that today, and I just pray that every one of you will go from here today renewed, including myself, renewed with the desire to walk with Jesus moment by moment. Never spend time whining and, and being angry at something that happened or some person. The minute the temptation comes to you, to be angry with anybody, to feel sorry for yourself because something has happened. Don't spend uh, the day or th uh, any time uh, going through all of this, uh, oh, it was so terrible, and tell people and call somebody else and how to, you know, and being angry or being fr fussy or being depressed or listening to the devil. Don't spend any time doing that. When you have Jesus right beside of you, he isn't left. He's right there by his spirit. He wants to talk to you. He wants to guide you. He wants to give you His Spirit. He wants you to give your spirit to Him, spirit or, or feelings and so forth, and say, Lord, what do you want to give me? What gift do you want to give me? And He'll say, I love you, or whatever He says. And it just calms the waters when you hear His voice. And you, you can keep on going. And I'm going to read one more thing, and then we'll close. Tender, compassionate, ever considerate of others. How about that? 
tender, compassionate, ever considerate of others. He represented the character of God and was constantly engaged in service for God and others. As Jesus was in human nature, so God means his followers to be. In his strength, we are to live the life of purity and nobility, Amen. which the Savior lived. That's from Sons and Daughters of God, page 21. That's my challenge to myself and to you, and that is, it's time to go home. Amen. We've seen enough of sin. We've heard the devil talk to us enough and beat us up. We want to get out of here. And we can do that by letting Jesus live out his life completely in us and give us the power. And while he's doing that, he gives us his love. Is there anything that compares with his love? No. So we have that opportunity to walk with him and receive his love, receive his power, receive his character, and soon Jesus will come to take his bride home. Amen. Dear Father in heaven, dear Jesus, thank you so much for what you have done, both of you. I know that it wasn't just Jesus, Father, because you were in your son. You suffered with him. You felt with him. You gave him life. You gave him per the perfection that both of you had from eternity. And now I know, Father, and Jesus, that you are looking forward to us coming home. Please help us, Lord, not to, not to drag this thing out any longer, but to walk with you and talk with you and receive your Holy Spirit, the perfection of your character. In Jesus' name, amen.